Red warnings, teachers absolutely refused to challenge Common Core and FedEd when they had the chance. Now, educrats are using the pandemic to further their goal of eliminating teachers altogether. Moral of the story, there is no compromise with progressive globalists. I'm Dr. Duke, she's Katie, and this is The Dr. Duke Show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Dr. Duke Show, the only program that keeps you educated on the craziness impacting K-12 classrooms and college campuses around the world. Today, we're talking with our international correspondent, Alex Newman, about a new program that seeks to replace actual physical teachers with computer programs and AI, part of the globalist scheme. We will learn that this will make it much easier to push any agenda or viewpoint to millions of children because there won't be a live body in the classroom. But Katie kicks things off with a look at the health of the Republic this week. This week on Healthy Republic, I wasted more of my life by watching yet another political documentary. This time, it's Michelle Obama's Becoming. Why won't the Obamas just go away? They left office more than three years ago, but they are always lingering, waiting for another opportunity to do what they do. Obama out. <laughs> Except not. Former First Lady Michelle Obama proves this with last week's release of the Netflix documentary called Becoming. Now, question of the day. What is she becoming? You let me know in the comments. Here's the gist. Michelle wrote a book about her life, and then she went on tour for the book. And she did a documentary about the tour, about the book. I should have counted how many seconds were devoted to crying over the Obamas. But then I would have cried, out in pain, for having to watch it again. You knew this documentary was going to be special when the thing kicked off with Oprah introducing her fellow Chicagoan. She is your hometown girl from the south side of Chicago. Welcome, Michelle Obama! You felt like Michelle just wanted to take that mic from Oprah and be like, it's mine now. And maybe Michelle's going to compete with Oprah for all of the money since she got a $60 million advance to write the book. $60 million. And then it was the 34 city book tour in 2018 to 2019, which is what the documentary is showing. And then the documentary was produced by Higher Ground, which is the Obama's entertainment company. <laughs> yeah, two words, cha-ching. The whole idea of doing the tour is to be able to have the time to actually reflect, to figure out what just happened to me. It's kind of the panic moment of, yeah, this is totally me. Unplugged for the first time in a long time. And it's the circle of nepotism here. But remember, I am from the south side of Chicago. That tells you as much about me as you need to know. And yet, here we are with a documentary about you and the hard-hitting questions. Oh, it's got a top belt, too. Oh, I see, I see. But it's not separated? No, it's one belt, but you buckle it three different times. And is that the style to have your belt so high now? Is that the style? I don't know. We People, don't, I don't, so I, don't I, I don't. I don't. I just asked. Don't buy it. That was the style. Oh, yes. You. Yes. I, I, you. I, I, Zip it. No. Let's go. That was a compliment. Just, I like no, the no, belt no. up that high. <laughs> That's Craig Robinson, Michelle's older brother, who several times was backhand complimented by his sis, Mish. Apparently, Craig was mom's favorite, as Mish kept saying. Everybody in the world knows who she is. It, that, that's incredible. Everybody in the world knows who my sister is. What is that? That's, that's dumb. Nobody should have to deal with that. No one. No brother should have to deal with their sister being the most popular person in the world. I wouldn't go that far, Craig, but I would say no one should have to deal with all of that. That I can get behind. There were plenty more compliments from Michelle's biggest supporters. Knowing how to engage in an interview, is a, it's a skill. It's a skill. I mean, Colbert is the best. Yeah. He will get into some dangerous territory. Now, before you guys were in the White House, did he ever get up and get you coffee in bed on Mother's Day? Nah. Wow. Profound. Hard-hitting. 
that question, it, it just blew me away. There was one section of the documentary that I took to heart in a non-heartful manner. Remember that, right? I was senior class treasurer, yes. I was still that kid. <laughs> you were on the honor roll. What's that supposed to mean, Michelle? Hmm? I was senior class president. I was on the honor roll. Step off it, lady. Now, while she did talk about her academics and focus on career, Michelle spent just a smidgen of time talking about her own daughters. It was my aspirations and dreams. I made that concession, not because he said you have to quit your job, but it felt like I can't do all of this. So I have to tone down my aspirations. I have to dial it back. Okay, well, that got awkward. But surely Barack focused on the family. Barack was prioritizing himself in a way. It's like, we had babies. He was at the gym. I was like, how you, how you find time to work out? <laughs> okay, apparently not a lot changes. Barack still needs his time to himself, even in the midst of a worldwide pandemic, when we are ordered to stay put and not go outside. He had a tea time at the Robert Trent Jones Golf Club in Gainesville, Virginia, which is why he must have missed the robocall from his wife about not going out. Remember, we urge you to stay home except if you need essential health care, essential food or supplies, or to go to your essential job. Hitting little white balls is essential for him. As we know, no documentary is complete without a healthy dose of politics thrown in. You know, so the day I left the White House and I write about how painful it was to sit on that stage and that a lot of our folks didn't vote. So it was almost like a slap in the face. Tell me more about that slap. It wasn't just in this election, but every midterm, every time Barack didn't get the Congress he needed, that was because our folks didn't show up. After all that work, they just couldn't be bothered to vote at all. That's my trauma. But as First Lady, weren't you representing all Americans, not just your folks? Isn't that what's supposed to happen? Your husband was president of, shoot, what's it called? Ah, the United States. He's the one always talking about that hope. And toward the end of the documentary, she provided some hope. Barack and I are not interested in being at the forefront forever. Not even for that much longer. Hallelujah! So there you have it. Hope. The real question will be, who's going to win the Oscar? Sorry, that's patriarchy. The Oscar. Who will win the Oscar for best documentary? Will Michelle win this upcoming year? Or will her equally annoying counterpart, Hillary, take the golden calf for her woe is me life story that was on Hulu? I wait with bated breath. But not really. Until next time, stay healthy, America. Joined now today by Alex Newman, our international correspondent. Alex, thanks for being with us today. Thanks so much for having me, Duke. It's always a pleasure. Well, there is no limit, is there, to what technocrats and globalists, how they will try to become opportunistic with crises, right? Rahm Emanuel's old statement that never let a crisis go to waste. And so one really unexamined aspect of the quarantine of public school kids sending everybody home is what we call, believe it or not, post-human education. Uh, this is a really shocking concept, Alex. Talk about post-human education. What is it, and how are the globalists going using coronavirus to push for it? Yeah, thank you, Duke. This is going to be, I think, the next big wave in the education system, if we want to call this monstrosity an education system. And, uh, you know, to our credit, not to toot our own horn too much, but we've been some of the few who've been talking about this. Um, you know, there now it's kind of coming out into the open. The U.S. Department of Education is writing regulations to facilitate this. They're opening up the funding streams to make it happen. Uh, the World Economic Forum is bragging about it. And so what they want to do is gradually sideline teachers and replace those teachers with computer programs and algorithms and artificial intelligence and feedback loops and mechanisms. Uh, and, and I think the thinking is, Duke, that you know, as long as you have the teachers there, that's a big obstacle because the teachers come to the table with their own set of values. You know, a lot of them don't want to teach kindergartners that they can, you know, surgically mutilate themselves and become a new gender or that socialism is good. So they keep running into this barrier, but they want to sideline teachers. And, and it really goes back to B.F. Skinner. 
uh, the behavioral psychologists who really viewed children as kind of like circus animals, biological stimulus response mechanisms that could just be trained through repetition, you know, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement. Uh, and they figure they'll be able to do that much more successfully with computers. And they're taking full advantage of this coronavirus pandemic to uh, move us in that direction very, very quickly. Yeah, you and I, like you said, have been talking about this for 10 years. This goes to some of the earliest Common Core talks I gave in 2011, 2012. We were telling teachers this, right? And they, they looked at me like I was crazy. Oh, you're exaggerating. This is where I think the rubber meets the road for teachers. We have had a darn hard time getting teachers to actually fight back. I've said this from the beginning. If teachers are willing to walk out on their kids in the middle of a semester, leaving them high and dry, red for ed to get pay raises in places like California or Arizona or Colorado, then why have they not been willing over the last 10, 20 years to actually walk out and protest this automization of what they do, turning them into facilitators, taking away from teachers freedom to pick books, the ability to teach in a certain way, regulating them. But the teachers have been utterly and completely subservient. It seems to me that this now is something that teachers better wake up about. They, they didn't implement Common Core to help you. They didn't implement all this top-down standards to make you have a better life, teachers. They did it so they could ultimately move to phase two, which is to get rid of you. That's right. And, you know, I, I think a big part of the blame falls right on the labor unions. You know, the labor unions are great at stirring up the teachers to be all mad about, you know, pay raises or this and that. Uh, but when it comes to actually benefiting the children and, and maintaining that teacher child relationship and uh, giving academic freedom and ensuring that teachers are allowed to do uh, what they know is best, uh, you know, the unions are nowhere to be found. So it's, it's really disappointing. And when teachers do resist, uh, they're often fired. You know, we actually wrote about uh, Jennifer McWilliams, a teacher in Indiana who uh, resisted this red for ed hysteria, who resisted the social emotional learning, posted some criticism up on Facebook, and then was promptly fired after being informed that she was a right wing extremist from uh, from the administration at the school. So, uh, you know, teachers are going to have to fight back here if they truly value their profession, if they truly value the well-being of their children. But, you know, what's happened here is they've kind of got the union bosses on board and they're saying, oh, don't worry, we're not going to fire the teachers. They'll still be there. They're just going to be uh, facilitators. And, and, and actually, the way the World Economic Organization, one of the experts or the World Economic Forum, one of the experts that they quoted, that uh, they're going to be co-creators of knowledge with the children. They're not just going to be uh, imparting knowledge. They're going to be co-creators of knowledge, which is just another way of saying they're not going to be teachers anymore. And uh, you know, this is very, very uh, crazy stuff. It's, it's very totalitarian. And I think it's going to facilitate uh, indoctrination on a level that we've never seen before. Because again, you've always had those teachers there who, who at least put a limit on how far they could go. Now, if they can get all the kids just staring at their computer, getting their positive and negative reinforcement, uh, it's going to change the game. On to our next segment, which isn't even a story, but a few questions. We got some questions from the audience that appear to be burning questions, needing answers. And we're going to kick it off with Karen from Westfield, Wisconsin. She says, Dr. Duke and Katie, as you know, this lockdown seems to never end. I know people are binging streaming services. So what should we watch at this point? Dr. Duke? What have you been watching? Gosh, uh, you know, lots of things. There's kind of a, we've, we were on a British TV kick lately. Mm. So we've been watching a lot of videos, uh, BBC type things. Uh, we've been watching uh, a show called Peep Show, which is a half hour comedy <laughs> show. I know. And it is a little bit raunchy, I got to tell you. It's British humor, It's isn't British. It? It's British humor, right? Mm. What is it about the British humor that they can say really raunchy things, but they, sound, they don't sound because raunchy? Because they're so dry. It's just... It's a show it that was on for about nine years. It ended a couple of years ago. And it's a sitcom, basically. But it, 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 it takes that perspective that The Office was using, nice. right? Where you're, the, the, you got two, two roommates, two, two male roommates. And it's the, they're, they're early 30-somethings. Okay. And it's all about the vagaries of their life. They live together. One's a complete slacker loser. The other's a complete control freak. So like the odd couple. It's kind of like the odd, exactly. Kind of like a young British odd couple. Uh, again, I, I don't recommend you watch this with the kids. But uh, it is amusing in its own right. Well, while well, you're watching British shows, I am as well. Yeah. I discovered the Great British of course you did. Baking Show. <laughs> and I'm someone who doesn't cook or bake, but now I got a bre I'm making bread for the first time because little Mary Berry, if you've ever watched Mary Berry, she's the gr 
I don't even know how old she is, but she's a little British lady and she's like the queen over there of all things baking for the average person. And she's one of the judges. And then Paul Hollywood and he's, he's all about the breads and it's just that one you can watch with the kids and you should, because it's just fun to watch these amateurs make different things. And they're so polite about it when they do bad, like, Oh, darn. are you making bread or did you buy a bread machine? No, I'm making From bread. Scratch? Yeah. Nice. With the dough and the flour and everything. I should also point and kneading. out. kneading. Ne- oh. Kneading. She's kneading. Okay, I'm good. kneading. Kneading. I uh, would also point out, I, I don't know uh, if you've ever watched Breaking Bad. It is, again, it's adult viewing. I mean, so, but uh, if you've watched Breaking Bad, I would really recommend, well, uh, Better Call Saul, <laughs> which has been on for five years now. So it's a sequel. It's a, it's a prequel to Breaking Bad. And I didn't mention it first because it, the, the last episode for the fifth season aired about a month ago. Mm-hmm. But it is really it's some of the best written TV I've ever seen. I mean, a lot of people talk about Ozark. And I've actually, we've actually watched o- Ozark, too. Oh, and wow. Ozark is interesting. It's good. Uh, but I think the writing still on Better Call, Call, Better Call Saul is, is levels higher than that. And then go make some patisserie. Some patisserie. So uh, Alex in Twin Falls, Idaho, says, I'm a huge fan of The Office, and I always hear Dr. Duke making references to the show. What's your favorite episode, and who's your favorite character? Oh, that's easy. My favorite episode <laughs> of course, that's easy. is episode 68 oh my gosh, you know of the, the original run. And, and we didn't, I did not prep that in advance. I know it. It's the one. It's called Dinner Party. It's the Dinner one Party after. Dinner Party was going to be Oh, my, my God. After like Jan gets five. fired from Dunder Mifflin, uh, she goes back to live with Michael, which is Take the absolute over. low point of her life. Yeah. And Michael and Jan invite Jim and, and uh, Pam. Pam and Angela and Andy over. It is, it's dysfunction TV at its best. When Michael pulls out where he sleeps a little bed at the <sighs> end of the... <laughs> How about, it's like a they, dog bed. They walk into the bedroom, right? Yep. And then they're like... Oh, I just got this new flat screen TV. Is that where you're talking? That's right. Your- <laughs> it's all plasma. It's well, when, you, when they walk into the bedroom, as you said, the one you said was funny, because they walk into the bedroom and right away there's a camera in the bedroom. <laughs> and Jan's like, I thought you put that away. Right? And then, of course, Michael sleeps on a little bench, a little dog bench. Oh, my God. Just, just- yeah, that's, that's but the one. But the best scene, I think, in the whole series is fire drill. When Dwight decides to test everyone uh, in the office, and so he has this fake fire it's a real fire but like a fake fire and everyone panics because they think it's fire and he has all the doors locked and then (laughs) oscar jumps up into the ceiling tiles and angela's like safe bandit and the cat flies up into the tile and just falls back Uh, you know and i think in that episode the the scene afterwards Uh, where they're sitting in tour corporate and they're thinking about firing dwight that's as hysterical as the actual scene is because you know dwight has that attitude like what did i do it's quite amusing. <sighs> I got to compose myself. And finally, Chels from Amherst, Ohio asks, Hello, Dr. Duke and Katie. I'm a homeschooling mom. I know you are a big advocate of the classical method of education, but was wondering if you have thoughts on other methods, like the Charlotte Mason method, or really on any other of the many homeschool methods out there, unschooling, eclectic, traditional, etc. Well, Shells, a, sh- a shout out to you from, from Ohio. Uh, I'm from Cleveland originally, so Amherst, mm-hmm. I know exactly where that is. Um, you know, I, I think that um, with, when it comes to homeschooling, what's, what's great about homeschool moms is that they can smell stupid a mile away. That's why they're homeschooling. <laughs> Most homeschooling programs have some problems. Uh, and I would be, and I'm sure you know this, Chels, be very careful. Uh, a lot of homeschool programs have quietly aligned with Common Core without telling you. Uh, they, the books and some of the pedagogy that, that they, are, they make available, they, they don't advertise it because they know homeschoolers don't want it, but they have moved that way. So anything that looks suspicious that way, I would avoid it. I do think, and this is naked, completely naked, bald plug for us, I think we've done a very good job at Freedom Project, uh, and I know you're a homeschooler. We're an online school that helps you homeschool. But I would recommend to any mom and dad who wants to homeschool but doesn't want to pay anybody else or doesn't want to have anybody else involved, go to Freedom Project's website. You can see every book for every class that we teach, all the way from kindergarten through high school. You can see all the books, all the texts, everything we do, you can see, and you can see that free of charge. And uh, I think if you look at that, you will see that we're pretty pristine in terms of giving a solid classical education, divorced from all that other garbage. Today on Instant Classic, we stopped to consider the masterpiece that might be 
a master mistake. Leonardo da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi. Fewer than 20 known works by Leonardo exist, and Salvatore Mundi, which means savior of the world, was the only one to remain in a private collection. It was sold at auction for $450.3 million in 2017 to Prince Badr bin Abdullah, setting a new record for most expensive painting ever sold at public auction. Perhaps the most interesting fact about the painting is that nobody is completely clear that it actually is painted by Leonardo. And anytime you go to the picture, Mike, anytime you actually consider a painting by da Vinci, you're going to get into this amazing news. This is a big deal. And again, as you said, it was sold for more money than any painting in the history of the world. And it may be fake. If not fake, it may be not really by the hand of the master. Uh, if you look at the actual face of, of Christ in Salvatore Mundi, you see those beautiful hands, right? The two fingers down, the two fingers up. He's clearly about to make the sign of the cross in a Catholic way, in a, uh, as the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church would have in the 16th century. Uh, the painting we think comes from about the year 1500. And if you look at the face of Christ, <clears throat> it has that veiled look, that, you, that, that gauzy look. It's called sfumato, right? That, uh, that technique that, that almost, he was almost unique in using by himself, sfumato, where he would make it look gauzy, right? Almost as if you're looking at the face of Christ through a veil. Uh, if you go back to the Mona Lisa, of course, his other great painting, that you do have a veil and you do have that really gauzy sfumato look. Uh, it's a hard thing to do. So many have argued that uh, this is a painting that may be modeled off of da Vinci's work. Maybe there was an original that had been lost or that uh, uh, a number of, of associates working with da Vinci may have contributed a lot to it. The biggest bone of contention in the picture, though, is if you look at the crystal orb that is in the left hand, he's, he's making the sign of the cross with his right hand. In his left hand, he's holding a, a translucent crystal globe which is meant to signify the celestial heavens, right? The realms of fire and crystal. And, and they signify where Christ gets his power from. That's where he came. He is the God who made the universe. He lives in the heavens. He, he has become, the son of God has become Jesus Christ in human form. And carrying that ball, that crystal ball, sig signifies the crystalline heavens. But here's the problem. If you look through the globe, the ball, you will see that the palm of Christ is not refracted. And as many uh, art historians have pointed out, that any, looking through any glass like that would distort what's behind it. And da Vinci was far too intelligent and far too clear in his understanding of optics to have made a mistake like that. So these are all questions that are on the table for this wonderful painting. It's a beautiful painting for whoever made it, but it's very much in the school of da Vinci. A mystery. Well, that's your week. As always, you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And if you have a question for our Friday Q&A, visit freedomproject.com slash askduke or send us a message on social media. But before we go, let's wrap things up with your Friday fun fact for the family. Did you know water covers about 70% of the earth and about 70% of an adult's body is water? And I must say that's refreshing. It just makes me want to pee. Hmm. And that's going to do it for us this week. For Freedom Project, I'm Dr. Duke. She's Katie. Till next time, stay hydrated and have access to a bathroom, my friends. Hey.